when that mood is going up and down and up and down, what you're really doing is you are stimulating that mitochondria to burn out a bunch of fuel and then it crashes. You don't have a flexible metabolism. You go to zero and they starve and they get crabby and irritable. And that looks just like a non-focused, irritable attention deficit. And so then it's much easier to label, give it a pill, stimulate the crap out of it, and not fix the problem, but have a prescription that must be the answer. But I think it is a, a tragedy that it is not better educated that your brain prefers ketones. And when you fuel it like that, it works like a superpower. We are the most advanced brain on earth. And when you fuel it correctly, it is quickly recovered. Hello and welcome to A Whole New Level. This is Dr. Casey Means, co-founder and chief medical officer of Levels, and I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Annette Bosworth, otherwise known as Dr. Boz, to our show today. We are going to be talking about keto diets, of which Dr. Boz is a trailblazer and leader. We're going to be talking about brain optimization, chronic disease reversal, and exactly how to know if you are reaching a ketogenic state. Dr. Boz is incredible. She was one of the early physician leaders uh, using YouTube and media to get her message out. She's been making YouTube videos for over 10 years, has 500,000 subscribers on her Dr. Boz YouTube channel, and it is a wealth of information. She is a physician trained in internal medicine. She is a faculty member. She's taught at University of Utah and University of South Dakota. She's written two incredible books, Any Way You Can and Keto Continuum. She's an author, storyteller, mother. She's been featured in so many outlets like CNN, Time, US News, and World Reports. She also speaks all over the community, in churches, in jails. She hosts a support group in a bowling alley. She speaks at universities. She is so passionate about getting the message of metabolic disease reversal out, which is so important. We're facing a metabolic disease epidemic in this country, and Dr. Boz is really a crusader. She has been successfully reversing type 2 diabetes, obesity, addictions of all kinds uh, for decades now. We are going to talk about how to use continuous glucose monitors in relation to ketone monitors. We're going to talk about how to do the keto diet and how to know if you're in ketosis. We're going to talk about fasting. We're talking about incredible, inspiring patient stories. This is an amazing uh, opportunity to speak with one of the world leaders in the ketogenic diet, and I could not be more excited to have Dr. Boz here. Welcome to a whole new level, Dr. Boz. Well, thank you, Casey. This is truly my honor. You guys do great work, and uh, the megaphone you have for helping patients see their metabolism, I'm, I'm being a girl fan right now. Like, oh. Well, we are clearly on such a shared mission to improve the metabolic health status in this country and reverse the monumental chronic disease epidemic. And you've taken such a fascinating approach to doing this by really like speaking of microphones, megaphones, you have been one of the earliest um, sort of physician leaders in merging medicine and media to educate patients in a way that's really going to land for them. And a big focus of yours has been keto. So for the the people listening who may be somewhat unfamiliar with the ketogenic um, strategy of diet. Can you speak to the basics of what nutritional ketosis is and how it has a relationship with chronic disease prevention and reversal? So a ketogenic diet is, uh, it's a marker of, in my mind, as an internal medicine, it's a marker of health that your body can use not just glucose, as your fuel source, but as glucose and this other thing called a ketone. The best similarity between glucose and ketones is that we can measure them. Uh, we can also burn fat in our mitochondria and a few little proteins if we're really being technical. But the big, the big, you know, hit it out of the park, where do we get our energy? Glucose and ketones are it. And when I'm looking for people's metabolism to be healthy, to reverse the problems that have landed in their lap that put them in my clinic, well, that mitochondria has to be able to use both of those. So um, a nutritional ketosis means you're eating in a way that you don't have um, enough fuel to stay completely in the default, which is glucose, 
uh, or most people, you know, resort to first thing in the morning. Their body wakes up with uh, you know, a burst of glucose. But then storage isn't supposed to be abundant. <laughs> and the storage of that is supposed to last a few hours. And you're supposed to bring on this, this long-acting fuel called the ketone, which comes from fat. But in our world, and especially in an internal medicine world where chronic disease is the norm, you know, 12 prescriptions is the average, not the uh, extreme, but the average. And those prescriptions are all written because your mitochondria has been using glucose way too often. And ketones are in the far distant past. So when I look at um, the, the term ketosis, um, it's a measurable term. It's not an opinion. It means that if you pee on a stick that measures ketones in a, a urine dipstick, there would be ketones in your urine. If you pricked your finger to check if, you're, if there are ketones around, you would have ketones in circulation. Uh, a ketogenic diet isn't a menu. It's a chemistry set inside your circulation. And so I've actually, I've got a, a quick slide deck here that I think uh, is going to be the fastest way for us to get through the understanding of what am I talking about? And then I'm going to show you what most of my patients suffer from. And it's kind of the cliff notes, but I think you'll, your folks will be able to follow if we do a, a good job of just uh, talking through it. So I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. I would love that. Thank you. When I look at this, I want to tell you about it. So I, um, I have been doing mission trips. Uh, one of my, when I was on faculty, one of my jobs was I was the leader to take the medical students on a mission trip to Haiti. I've gone probably 50 times. But when my kids got old enough, I just couldn't leave home and still have them turn out not in my drug addicted clinic, but because my mom showed up and paid attention. Um, so we stopped doing in mission trips until last year. We went to Honduras. And my kids have always gone with me. Uh, this uh, boy is real, 10-year-old Willie. And he is from Honduras and has a much different metabolism than the 10-year-old from our country. So there's glucose on one side, ketones on the other, and the time on the bottom. But as you see here, you'll notice there are some uh, changes in the glucose throughout the day. When Willie eats, he eats um, uh, a pretty nutritious meal for, well, for anybody because he, he's in an orphanage. Uh, but the orphanage has some uh, limitations. They do not eat after five o'clock at night. And that spike in blood sugar uh, rises up to about 100 and it goes back down at the end of the, uh, his eating window and he does not snack after that. The volume of his food is also quite low actually. I mean, he doesn't eat much. Um, there's that little bitty uh, spike in the morning of a cortisol spike. And you can see that blood sugar will rise and fall based on when he is eating. And when you he stops eating, it kind of goes back down to about, you know, 62, 63 in the morning. Um, when he starts eating and when it spikes, um, it's related to his meals. And that's pretty true for all of us that we're going to raise our blood sugars when we eat and then it's gonna come back down, or at least that's what's supposed to happen. And how much it rises and falls, well, that's important to me if I'm gonna to try to help you reverse a problem. And it's incredible what you learn when you wear one of these CGMs, because you can get little curves like this. His eating window, this is another word I use, is what's the first bite of food to the last bite of food? And his eating window is close to nine hours um, with a first meal. The volume of food is also very low. His average blood sugars, which we measure with a hemoglobin A1C, but you can also statistically measure, is pretty low. Um, like in, in the, I think it's in the 80s, 4.5 is in the 75 to 80 range, I think. Now this blue line is what Willie does with his ketones. So again, prick your finger, look at your ketones. And so it starts out over here at about you know, 0 0.5 when, he's, when his body is using glucose. But when the glucose runs out and the storage is empty, up flies the ketones. And that is a stark comparison to when his, um, if he would like get up in the middle of the night and eat, those ketones would go away. So he burns glucose during one part of the day. He, he burns fat in the form of ketones at another part of the day. 
I just want to point out cortisol rises every morning. And when the cortisol rises, sugar comes into it. Even that little bitty blip of that glucose will shove his ketones back down to a baseline of about 0.5 or 0.6. That, um, that's just a little animation to say, here's the glucose, here's it going up and down. And uh, the rest of these slides won't, but really important for people to say, this changes. When people say, well, what should it be? I'm like, I don't know. There's about 10 more questions I need to know before I can answer that question for you. It is, what is it doing over time that is the most important? Like any data point, if you only have one, we're not going to get that good of an answer for you. But when we have a, a range of data for you, um, it really is helpful. So I call this the four-day forecast. So Willie is quite uh, rhythmical, predictable. He has no control over his glucose or his uh, meals. He's at an orphanage where it's rationed and very minimal. Uh, there is no snacking at night. And when you follow day one, day two, day three, day four, it's it's that solid of a plan. Uh, his uh, time spent in ketosis is well, it's like half of the day because when he's sleeping, uh, he's got ketones being bumped being uh, burned and glucose isn't zero, but it's not, it's much lower than what you'll find the rest of the time. All right. So in, in the uh, fear of being a little redundant, this is the, the zone for the burning fat. And I just want you to put that in your memory to watch what happens when uh, you compare that to uh, an American. So um, yeah. So here is here is our American. Um, we're going to call our American David. So David is also 10. And um, David could be, David is the person that I wrote about in Keto Continuum. But here is what his would have been had he, um, had you checked. So I want you to notice that his glucose is going up to well above 120 when he eats his meals throughout the day. Uh, his ketone level may rise during the evening hours. But it's uh, and it's it's got a baseline of um, ketones happening during the the night or during the day when he is eating glucose, but it is not nearly as robust as what um, Willie's was from Honduras. It's in the zone where those where the uh, ketones are burning that it is a strong metabolic stimulus for the mitochondria. And if I get to answer, what is a ketogenic diet? I'm like, it's a workout for your mitochondria to help keep the body low on inflammation. And if you just burp a few ketones into your circulation, well, maybe you can get rid of a, I don't know, a pimple or something. But if you've got um, metabolic disease or dementia or an autoimmune disorder, you got to have ketones around a lot more than that if you want me to have a chance of being able to crisscross those on the list of diseases that I used to say, oh, you're in no man's land. That's not reversible. Uh, here's just a, another look at that. His average blood sugar, unlike, um, unlike the Hondurans, is about 5.1. So that's about an average of 100. So average blood sugar of 100. And not terrible. Everybody's going to say, good job. It's great. But the volume of food that that American is eating is much more processed and a much higher volume. So let's uh, see what happens when we age. Um, this is just another demonstration of how it flips back and forth. That's what healthy looks like. He's not very old. He's 17. And when people say, well, how long do I have to do your ketogenic thing if I want to reverse this? I'm like, do you realize that you've been doing this for a long time? So I'd like you to notice in this uh, eating window, we have one, two, three, four meals he's eating now. And this he calls a snack. But when a glucose changes this much, I call that a meal. And so does your, in, so do your beta cells. They make enough insulin to cover that. And when you're wearing a CGM and you say, but I just had a few macadamia nuts. I'm like, I don't care. Look what your glucose monitor did. Uh, that insulin amount is overproducing. And every time you swallow food now, you're making insulin even though the textbook says, but it was all fat. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you think it's all fat, but there's other stuff in there. And in that process of eating, just the mastication, the chewing is now stimulating your parotid gland to tell your brain that here comes a bunch of carbs because that's what you've done for the last 30 years. But even at 17, um, we watch to see, yep, he's making some ketones, but not very much. 
his uh, glucose and ketones turn on and off uh, in a different way. We now have uh, a very low uh, zero is his baseline in between, whereas before his, his baseline was closer to 0 0.5. So again, there is absolutely no ketones being fueled in the 17-year-old who looks lean, who's very healthy, whose mom says, we don't snack at night, so we're fine. But his eating window is much larger than it should be. And the time he spends burning carbs versus burning fat, well, there's, there's just no comparison. After a few years uh, from his 10-year-old self to now his 17-year-old self, you're like, well, his average sugars aren't too bad. 115, 5.5, no problem. Yes, it is. If you want this child to not grow up with an immune system that is crippled or an insulin system that is resistant to the messages inside its cell, it's too high for a, for a healthy person. Uh, human beings were not designed for that. And when I watch um, uh, those, those numbers go higher and higher at an earlier age, I actually had a pediatrician call me um, probably about two years ago because I had given him the algorithm for how to treat type 2 diabetes, something he didn't learn in his pediatric years, but um, he needs to know now. And he's, he called me and said, well, what happens when I run out of all your drugs? And I said, what do you mean? Well, I've maxed them all out and his blood sugars are still high. I'm like, he needs a different mom. <laughs> you need to get the carbohydrates out of his life. You, you got to stop doing this because this is what he looks like when he's 40 years old. Uh, now we've got this man who's spent 20 years doing, he, you know, he's cleaned things up. He only has three meals a day, but his blood sugars go all the way up to 160 when he is, um, when he's eating his meals. And his eating window is more than 12 hours. It's probably about 13 or 14 hours. And his blood sugars are now up into that, you know, yeah, 6.1, which, you know, an average blood sugar of 125. Often, if you tech it 15 times in a row, you're going to find morning fasting ones that are in the diabetic range. He doesn't know it. He would never want you to say that out loud. That's just not me. I'm sure you're wrong. I looked in the textbook. It says it needs to be higher than that. I'm like, I don't care. You're so close to diabetes. You're just fighting over needles right now. It's not, uh, it's really not um, uh, an appropriate antidote for, uh, you know, saying, oh, I don't have it. I'm like, no, you've got a problem brewing deep inside your system. So let me go to what happens when our patient goes to um, 55 years old. You now have blood sugars that go way up here. So now you're above, above 60. And here's a couple things I like to point out. See how this doesn't get back down to normal in between meals? Well, those sugars, what it really looks like on a CGM is they hang out up here. Um, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's so close to a flatter line in between the meals that you know they're doing some damage to their, to their body and their brain. And the ketones, they are, they are rare. If you, if you had a ketone continuous monitor, if there was a thing, and I know folks are working on it, but I don't think, I don't see one on the market yet. But if you could, it's this really half a hot minute that you're, you made about five ketones and then your body said, no, no, he's going to, here comes cortisol in the morning. It's going to rise. And in the end, uh, that um, glucose going way up, burning the fuel that is short acting, that is not a, an anti-inflammatory or an antioxidant, but is instead uh, a really wasteful but rapid fuel. And with that comes a whole bunch of reasons you're going to end up seeing an internal medicine doctor. When, when I look at those slides, and I've, I've done that lecture many times and really find that as, as you watch, well, what do you do to get better? Uh, the key component is that you're going to need a, a way to recruit that, get those ketones back into your chemistry set. And when, when patients say, well, well, how many grams of fat should I have? Well, how many grams of protein should I have? I'm like, I don't want you counting any of those macros right now. I want you to keeping 20 total carbohydrates in one day, period. That's what you focus on. Now, I want you eating high fat. Some people can do that right out of the gate. Some people bang their head up against the wall and eat high protein with low fat, and then they feel terrible. Uh, and finally, when they sacrifice, they just kind of say, well, here's what I would recommend, is I would recommend you eat some steak, some sardines, <laughs> some high fat, um, you know, we could say ancestral foods that are filled with fat and that are not 
uh, uh, laden with a lot of carbohydrates. And even in my advanced diabetics, uh, in my, I'm injecting insulin, uh, my A1C is in the double digits, which now has a blood sugar of north of 270 at least. And that was in my no man's land. You're never going to get back from this. That's not reversible. And I have crisscrossed that out. You have to reduce this, not for a week not for 10 days, not for a month and a half, but until your beta cells are not overproducing every time you chew. That's going to take time. And, you know, when I look at the, the price that people pay is they often don't hear this message until, well, until their brain wasn't working right. And that's, um, that's not, uh, that started at 17 for our David. His brain changed, his ability to be resilient, to have the reversal of anxiety, the depth of his sleep, all of that changes when glucose is the only thing that you're fueling those cells on. Uh, that even though he could produce some ketones and into his 20s and 30s, in the middle of the night, there were maybe an hour or two of ketones, not enough to keep away what we ask of our brains in this world, which is you need that deep depth of sleep you need the power of a, a, a strong source of ketones. And like I said at the beginning, it means that mitochondria cannot get a flash of ketones uh, you know, every, you know, every third week when you said, uh, I'm you know, fasting for Lent or I you know, got a colonoscopy. Or, you know, there's some reason that ridiculous human beings skip meals. Um, but... And, and when they do that, sure, we can wake them up just a little bit. That is not what nutritional ketosis is. That's a flash of your body you know, saving that one lever that you haven't been using, and it's going to try to use it in a, in, a, in a moment where you do something different than you've been doing. That's not how you reverse these problems. That's not how brains get to peak performance. Uh, they really do need a journey where ketones are routinely delivered into the space uh, and glucose comes down, especially that average glucose comes down. What an incredible overview and explanation. I know that's going to help so many people. And I just thank you for, for going through that. If you've heard me talk on other podcasts before, you know that I believe that tracking your glucose and optimizing your metabolic health is really the ultimate life hack. We know that cravings and mood instability and energy levels and weight are all tied to our blood sugar levels. And of course, all the downstream chronic diseases that are related to blood sugar are things that we can really greatly improve our chances of avoiding if we keep our blood sugar in a healthy and stable level throughout our lifetime. So I've been using CGM now on and off for the past four years since we started Levels, and I have learned so much about my diet and my health. I've learned the simple swaps that keep my blood sugar stable, like flax crackers instead of wheat-based crackers. I've learned which fruits work best for my blood sugar. Like I do really well with pears and apples and oranges and berries, but grapes seem to spike my blood sugar off the chart. I'm also a notorious night owl, and I've really learned with using Levels how if I get to bed at a reasonable hour and get good quality sleep, my blood sugar levels are so much better. And that has been so motivating for me on my health journey. It's also been helpful for me um, in terms of keeping my weight at a stable level uh, much more effortlessly than it has been in the past. So you can sign up for levels at levels.link slash health, get access to a continuous glucose monitor and the level software that helps you really uh, dial into a lot of these strategies for your life and your body. One framing that I, I love um, is, is that in many ways, the body is a pharmacy in its own right. You know, it can produce things based on stressors and inputs that we put on it or conditions that we put on it. Like a deep diaphragmatic breath can have you, you know, squeeze out some more acetylcholine or whatnot, or get the vagus nerve to, to make certain things, you know, it's just, it's a, you can support the microbiome to make more serotonin, et cetera, et cetera. And I hear what you're saying is that like, you can put conditions around yourself that make your body a producer of ketones, which in an essence is a medicine. It's a, it's a healing chemical. It's a chemistry force that can be positive for the body. And so, and, and it, which 
is sort of like makes sense from what you're saying of like, you can't do it every three weeks and have a little flash. It's like, it wouldn't work if you were on a medication and took it once every three weeks. So how are you going to create a condition in which you're actually constitutively getting this? And my question for you is, what is it about this molecule, these key to or several molecules um, that are beneficial for the body? Is it the way they're impacting the mitochondrial health? Is it the anti-inflammatory benefit? It, you, you talk about how fat fuel outperforms carbohydrate fuel. Like what is actually happening when you make these ketones that's positive for our cellular health? Yeah, so when I explain metabolism, it, it is actually a really advanced discussion. The more, it's one of those uh, uh, topics that the more I understand, the more I realize, okay, I, I just don't know anything. <laughs> uh, but to give it to patients and say, well, how do I help them frame why I'm asking this, this uh, for, for a different chemistry set? For If you want me to get you off these prescriptions, I know that's, that's a nice talk and there's lots of folks out there saying, I stopped my meds, I stopped my meds. I'm like, how long and how are the numbers behind the scene? Uh, when you look at what a ketone body does, yes, it can be used as fuel. Uh, that is one major component that we store uh, we store fuel as strings of glucose called glycogen, and we store fuel as fat. Uh, when the glycogen storage or the glucose is empty or is in short supply that it, it needs to offer another option, this fat molecule can be, think of it as unspun into uh, a fuel called a ketone. When that ketone is in circulation, it does more than just offer a fuel. It is a signaling agent. It is a molecule that talks to other, other parts of our system and our body. That um, it is an antioxidant. It can you know, grab that rogue uh, electron and, 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 you know, de and stabilize it, take it out of the destru destructive mode of crashing into things and pull it back into that, um, that space of, uh, of energy. Uh, it also, um, well, ketones in circulation beget more ketones. They, they signal that the mitochondria in the liver should be making ketones. Uh, as as uh, we may or not, may not have disclosed at the beginning, I, have, um, I, I started out with a book that I didn't want to write, and then I tried to reach for products that I couldn't find in predictable uh, formulas that stayed the same and didn't have a bunch of fillers in them. So I ended up making a product and then I made a couple more products. And some of those products are the exogenous ketones that you can swallow, add to the circulation, and, um, and, and they can be used therapeutically. Uh, that Those exogenous ketones, one of my favorite uh, ways to use them is if you've worked with human beings, they'll do great for a while and then their old habits show up again. And as much as I would like them all to be the offspring of uh, James Clear and the atomic habit of stacking new habits on the next ones and getting better, uh, yeah, they don't exist in real world. They need to fall off the wagon and get back on and fall off the wagon and get back on. And what you'll find is they're like, ah, oh, it's just so hard to do. I don't want to do that again. Well, the truth is the first time you go keto, it, there is a there's a, an awakening of those mitochondria. They have they're kind of rusty. They haven't used ketones in a while. It could be slow to say, "Are you for real? Are these ketones actually here? Are we gonna, are we going to use them?" And so the mechanics of how to turn it into energy can be a little rusty. But as you stay in ketosis, you, I mean, in, within three or four days, you really can see a transition in how you feel. And then when they fall off again. Those glucose uh, gears are ready and waiting for you to go back to the old way you were you were doing. So when they when they carb binge or they have a bunch of booze or they do some things that would take them out of ketosis, um, well, they end up with um, no ketones in circulation. To add them back exogenously before they cut the cord and go back to what they're supposed to be doing is an, a brilliant transition difference that has really helped people get back on the wagon. Just sip ketones for two days, draw a line in the sand that you're gonna go back to 20 total carbohydrates per day on this day. And in the two days prior to that, I need you drinking some ketones because those ketones in circulation will stimulate the production of ketones out of your mitochondria in the liver. So now you've got the mechanics that when you drop the carbs, it's not gonna hurt like that again. 
Uh, the other things that uh, we know there are, you know, histone deacetylase uh, signals that say the way you wind up DNA and and then wind it back together in its tight little uh, you know, coils, uh, it, that matters. And when you don't do it well, your body makes mistakes. And so we know that there are some excellent um, augmentations when a state of ketosis is the is the chemistry bath that your cells are in when they are replicating, when they are doing things. That <laughs> one of the benefits, dangers of being on YouTube since 2011 is <laughs> that people say, boy, you look different than you used to. I'm like, well, I've aged. <laughs> um, but what they tell me is, well, you've aged backwards. <laughs> so I think, well, what a great testimony to say, when my cells divide, they are in a bath of ketones most of the time. And um, my, my metabolism is closer to Willie's than it is to David when he was 40 or 50. Um, but I've birthed children. So I have, a, I have a chemistry set that has some hormones in it that make it, I have to be, I have to be pretty strict at how, at how I eat, how often I eat, and when I eat um, in order to keep that, that uh, good flexibility of turning ketones on and off in my system uh, in order to gain, well, do I have any skin cells that are dividing today? Probably. Are those skin cells using, are they in a bath of ketones or are they in a bath of a bunch of blood sugar? Uh, and that inflammatory state versus anti-inflammatory state, well, that kicks the crap out of any acai berry antioxidant, you know, apple cider vinegar stuff that patients say, I'm sure I'm getting better. I'm having a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar. I'm like, you're totally kidding yourself. It's not doing anything. You got to change your behavior. So when I, when I look at uh, a ketone state, I really do look at it at the best aging health is that those cells have a constant, uh, at least within a 24 hour period, access to some ketones. That is so interesting. Um, one question that comes up for me is just, you know, you mentioned less than 20 grams of carbohydrates per day. And I'm curious if people based on their finger prick readings and their glucose monitor readings are able to stay with low glucose spikes. So let's say pretty much never going above 110 after meals, 110 milligrams per deciliter and ketones are between, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 at baseline, maybe go up higher above one when they sleep or something like that. And I'm kind of asking about myself here, actually. So I used to be vegan um, and uh, I'm not anymore, but I was very focused on like a, a very low glycemic vegan diet that really had pretty fairly low net carbs. I was eating a lot of like, you know, lupini beans and, and beans that have very low net carbs, um, a lot of fiber. And I was able to keep glucose pretty much 24 hours a day under 110, my insulin's two to three, uh, triglycerides are 45, you know, just like everything was looking good, but I was definitely eating more than 20 grams of carbs a day. So my main question here is, and I was intermittent fasting, you know, or, you know, time restricted feeding, not eating late and sometimes doing more extended fast. If people can keep these numbers with a higher carb diet, slightly higher carb, very thoughtfully chosen higher carb diet. Do you think that that's what really matters is the fact that you're generating the outcome of a body bathed in ketones? Or is it truly the large percentage of fat in the diet and the very low net carbs that also is important? Or is it the outcome? Is it, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I, I look at that as... Um, so what I hear you saying, let's see if I've got the story straight. You're the, during the time when you're eating, there's more more than 20 carbs per day, but your continuous glucose monitor stays 120 or less. Yeah. I'm basically saying there's probably, there are people who are going to be able to get to ketogenesis potentially on higher carbs, which they can find because they're wearing a CGM and using a ketone monitor and maybe blending it with really good food timing and whatnot. And so is it more the outcome that you're looking for in a patient, like the actual generation of ketones in the body that you can prove on a monitor and keeping glycemic variability low and average glucose low? And if, if that may be on a slightly more liberal, slightly more liberal diet with carbohydrates, is that okay in your mind? Or is it the, is it the keeping carbohydrates below 20 
that actually in its own right is also important? Or, you know, have you had patients who have used technology to see what's kind of going on and they're actually like, oh, I can actually tolerate 100 or 150 grams of carbohydrates a day and still keep these outcomes, um, ketone production and low glucose and low insulin. So let's answer the question specific for your metabolism. So have you ever had a, a, a weight problem? Have you been, let's say, 50, outside of pregnancy, 50 pounds overweight uh, for more than six months? I actually have, yeah. I, w I was tipping the scales over 200 when I was in eighth grade. I was, I was a very overweight child, yeah. Okay, so then when did the weight come off? The weight came off when I was 15. Um, I got really into nutrition and dropped the weight and became an athlete. And then I actually gained weight again when I was in college and then dropped it again in my early 20s. And then I've basically been a stable weight since I was 22. And now I'm 35 and have not had kids. Okay. Okay. So give me the, the weight gain in college. So the metabolism at that peripubertal uh, tells about some stress and some changes uh, that you reset uh, is a, you can do some life predictions at that point. So now tell me what happened in college. How high did the weight go and how long was it on? The it went back up to probably about 50 pounds overweight both times and then dropped it twice and then, and then learned about metabolic health and basically was able to, has been able to keep it, um, but uh, keep it stable, but it's definitely work. You know, I've devoted my life to this field and really focus my diet on making sure that the, the glucose readings, you know, stay, stay low, um, and that my insulin always stays low. And so be, and, and that I'm generating ketones and I check my ketones almost every day. So that, that is now what dictates sort of my diet. But what I'm doing is reverse engineering what the chemistry is going on in the background. So in your baseline ketones, what numbers do you usually find first thing in the morning? First thing in the morning, if I'm really dialed, I they're usually around like, and again, my diet is now not not vegan, but um, I would say like 0.9 to 1.5. So that's a perfect number. And then what was the glucose when that happens? 75 to 85. Okay. So now go to a less than perfect season. If I'm, if I'm like, on vacation and not doing a great job with just sort of like drinking a little bit more and kind of eating more restaurant food, my ketones will be like 0.1 or 0.2. And then how high does morning fasting glucose go? If everything is off the rails, like it can get up to the high 90s when all my stuff is dialed in, like it'll be 75 to 85. Right. So it, ever wake up with a triple digit morning fasting sugar? Never, ever, ever. Okay. So that that's a huge predictor for where I separate insulin resistance. Like when they're, you know, when they dial it in, you can make anybody who is in good health. I mean, their mitochondria will rescue them. They will give the good numbers. They will have a doc. I call it a Dr. Boz ratio. Again, I did not come up with that, but it's, it is duck and it's very helpful. Uh, when I was teaching my mom how to do this calculation of what is her, met, her GKI, um, she had chemo brain. She couldn't think that well. And she's a brilliant woman, but like, oh God, woman, what do you mean? Take it to one and uh, you know, like too much. So I said, okay, mom, divide the big number by the little number and I'll do the rest of the math for you. Well, that's the Dr. Boz number. So you take the glucose and that's in uh, uh, milligrams per deciliter. And then you take the ketones, which is in millimoles per liter. So that it's dirty math. Uh, you take the glucose divided by the ketones. So when the Dr. Boz ratio um, would be above 100, people aren't losing weight, but when they can flex frequently in a week that their glucose uh, is in that, um, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, maybe 90s, and then their ketones are quick to rescue them, that they've got a good ratio, then I know their metabolism is strong and flexing. It's doing what Willie did. When they have a, um, when they have a history of insulin resistance, you'll see them dial in. And of course, they always want to show me great numbers, right? And I'm saying, yeah, but what happens when I'm not looking? Go to the numbers when you're doing normal stuff. Uh, and especially when you go on vacation, uh, when you're not thinking about your metabolism, how high does the blood sugar go? Because we know the glucose is going to go into the, or the ketones is going to go into the, into the pot. Uh, but if that glucose in the morning stays in the double digits and doesn't go to triple digits, well, then I know we're in a healthier metabolism. And so your question was, well, how many carbs can I have? And I said, the answer is enough to keep your morning numbers 
with a Dr. Boss ratio of 80 or less says you're not building chronic disease. You're not um, putting on weight that um, they say, well, I, I, am I am I doing that today? I'm like, I don't know. Check. So that Dr. Boss ratio is really this day to day data point that I know you mentioned insulin. I've actually fallen away from checking people's insulin because it's uh, it's expensive. They need me to do it. Um, and the two molecules that are most impacted by insulin, glucose and ketones. And I don't need one point of data. I, uh, there's a great study out there looking at all the different ways that you can raise somebody's morning fasting insulin. And one of them is, you know, have a, have a car ride. <laughs> I'm like, what do you think they're going to do to get to the lab? Uh, you know, have a bowel movement. Uh, have a restless night's sleep. Well, okay. It just the number was so ridiculous. Like, okay, what do you think my patients are doing? They're doing all of these things. So what is the real uh, insulin? Oh, you sat in the lab for an hour and a half and the lady took two pokes to get your uh, your blood drawn. We're like, okay, you just screwed it up. Uh, so so quit it. And then it, I mean, you do a craft insulin test. Now, I haven't actually personally tried to order this in a couple of years, but the last time I did this, they charged my patient $2,500 for the glucose. Yeah, for the glucose. And then you have to do the insulin with it, right? So it's a two hour glucose tolerance test plus the insulin. But what it really was is they needed a, I mean, I don't deny that their bill was justified because they needed a dedicated person with a timer to say, you cannot wait an hour and a half. That screws this up. I need it at this minute, at this time. At this. And without the formula, I can't make sense of this. So instead, well, let's let the patient keep track of it. Um, let's let them show us what the numbers are. And well, let's teach them on YouTube about this ratio, which is really a GKI saying you got to have glucose and ketones. And they both need to have uh, in this range that will predict, is Casey going to gain weight in the pattern she's eating? I don't know. Check her Dr. Bob's ratio for a couple weeks and then and do it when you're being real. You don't have to show me. You don't have to show the doctor. I don't I mean I care, but I don't care. You care. And you're like, okay, if you're telling me that I need to give up that three o'clock meal every day because I'm now not 36, I'm 46, and I, uh, I, my body aged, and well, nobody told you, but now we need to do this differently. And so I look at the, the process of how I walk patients through uh, the steps needed. You wanna get better? Let me show you how I do this for patients. So I, I just wanted to make sure just for the take home for people listening for the Dr. Boz ratio, uh, it's fasting glucose over uh, fasting ketones. So first thing in the morning, and you're looking for that to be under 100. Under 100 says you're, you've got a good metabolism. You're finding the churn. If you're trying to reverse things, which is what most of the people coming to see me, if I look at a Dr. Boz ratio of 80, that number, they can lose weight. Okay. Every morning, if you're trying to lose weight, you got to hit that number. Now there are exceptions when people do that and they're not, they're not losing weight. And uh, those are, we can explore that if you want to. If I'm looking to reverse a serious medical problem, like an autoimmune disorder, like um, I hate this word, but leaky gut. So irritable bowel or a ulcerative, um, um, you know, gut in, uh, gut permeability. So it's leaking stuff back and forth, which is leaky gut. Everybody understands it. But uh, that that takes some really good science. You got to have a good chemistry set to do that. Uh, it's not so much your microbiome. It's the, what the cells on the inside need to do to repair you. Um, that when I'm So if I'm looking at one of those serious medical problems, you got to get to a 40 or less. And you got to hold that first thing in the morning, every day, every day, every day. Uh, it's hard to do uh, without some of the things that you offer and that we offer. When I'm working with a seizure patient or a cancer patient, I get their Dr. Bob's ratio down to 20 or less. And that would be essentially a, a glucose ketone index of one to one. So if you've looked into that, that's, uh, that's hard to do, but it is, uh, it's where you heal. Uh, when I look at, when I look at this, uh, this is what really, so I, I wrote this book that my husband you know, baited me with. And, <laughs> and then all these patients wanted help. And I said, well, I can't, I can't see them all. And so I'm back to this problem where YouTube was going to fix my problem because I was just going to educate them on YouTube. Uh, but the book really has a workbook and um, a, a very 
important part of uh, uh, the process is you understanding you. So as they go through this, we, uh, you'll see here there's a beginner's phase. And so when you ask that question of, well, how many, how many carbs can I get away with? I'm like, well, the beginner is going to have one answer. Uh, beginner's phase is really how you are uh, kind of coming up with that chemistry. You're getting people into um, this chemistry. And once they hit a ketosis state, um, dang, it's the easiest job ever. They do great. But then your body will adapt. And that's where people say, I did that keto thing and it worked for a while, but then it didn't. And like, so the word, the, the title of the book is Keto Continuum because, uh, well, things change. It, unless you're going six feet under, uh, you're going to have to adjust as you age and as different seasons of life. If you birth a child, there's a different rule set afterwards that you're just going to have to be more strict if you want to be lean. Um, that uh, we, we, I look at this uh, section as what I call the baseline metabolisms, where it really is time-restricted eating, um, that it is oh, not 1618. This one's been almost 168. And um, again, 16.8 is what this is supposed to say. Um, the, but if you look at number four, this two meals a day is what these 16.8 are. The boluses of food. <laughs> I say that word on purpose because if you go back to what, um, what David's uh, eating pattern when he was 17, he had that thing called a snack. But oh, it, it sent his glucose up so high that you should call it a meal. And so people say, well, I only eat two meals a day. And then you hear that they chew 15 you know, pieces of gum and they have a whole half a handful of Tic Tacs throughout the day. And they, they do all these things that are stimulating what the body does when you put things in your mouth uh, that, well, it didn't do anything to David uh, when he was 17, but it would definitely do something to you. It would definitely do something to me and anybody else who's been overweight for more than six months. And I don't mean like five pounds overweight. I mean, it's significantly overweight. So having um, this time-restricted eating with two boluses of food per day, and you are an adult, you do not need three meals a day, period. That is a myth. That is not true. Uh, two meals a day, putting, in, putting them in, in a certain period of time and then, you know, as we get down here to a 23 and 1, uh, this little bitty line where people go from 16-8 uh, to 23 and 1 doesn't happen in a little bitty line. It's a, a little bit more narrow, a little bit more narrow, a little bit more narrow. And when we get to an advanced level of, you know, 23 and 1, uh, which would still be if, like my eating window is probably about four hours in a day if I want to, if I, if I have, if I had workouts, then I can be a little, little more generous on my eating window. Um, but you know, if I have a week like this and I'm, well, some weeks, if I only get a one workout in, I should have a tighter eating window if I don't want to gain weight. That's the formula. How do I know that formula? I check my chemistry. I can tell you that if I, if I hop out of that and I do it for like three or four weeks in a row, guess what? I'm about five pounds up. And then if I go back to my, that, oh, then I'm about five pounds down. And so it, it, I mean, that's not just me. That's patient after patient that taught me, oh, here's what you're doing. Yep. I see that. And you know, one of the ways that a physician can see that is these continuous glucose monitors. They really do. It just pulls back the veil. Show me the truth. I, I don't care. I'm not being a, you know, it's not shameful. It's shameful that you've spent the last 15 years being told low fat, go exercise. And you're so stinking overweight and insulin resistant that that was never going to work until we fix this chemistry problem. Uh, and your 15 medications are a, are a result of not understanding this metabolism issue. Um, but you'll, you'll notice in here that this, this part here is stressing the metabolism. So there are many people who cannot, they cannot tighten up their eating window any further in the social world they have. I mean, every time I take my eating window down to two hours, my husband gets ticked off and why don't you eat with the family and what are you doing? So there's social stuff. Okay. I, I want to eat with the family. I have, you know, uh, it's a very important social time. Uh, I can't put another hour in my day. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't get to a workout. Okay, so there's there's certain levers that you can push to to, and one of them is the eating window. But then there's a time where you can completely remove eating. And so um, this word fast is one of the metabolism stressors. Now, obviously, you can go to, into a sauna. You can go for a workout. Uh, there are other ways to stress your metabolism. But when you're using food consumption and the timing of it. Uh, well, 
baseline metabolisms is where I ask people to live. Um, and then I ask them to stress their metabol metabolism intermittently once they uh, can find the rhythm that says, all right, if I keep it in this zone, it doesn't tick off the people I love. I actually can stick to it, but I do have to make a bunch of ketones every once in a while to prove that my mitochondria are in good shape. I have to stress that mitochondria and really get that ketone production high enough that um, that I, it can carry my health. It can, you know, do its antioxidant. It can, you know, make those skin cells in the right chemistry set where the next ones are might be in a more glucose. That you can get the outcomes you're asking for. I think one of the things that's um, so amazing about it is twofold. One is that um, it's it's all about the the body telling you the answers. I mean, it's like we can talk all day about how many carbs can I eat and is vegan okay, whatever. But it's like, what's the chemistry in the body? Like it's, I love your focus on measurement and, you know, and it really cuts through a lot of the noise. I think it's like, what is happening? That is what matters. And so of course we are believed within that at levels as well. But I think that, yeah. And you know, but I also think that it is, it is strict. It's like, yeah, no, I mean, just having, you know, glucose being 85 and ketones being, you know, 0.6. It's like, it's not, it's not, might not be enough, you know, if you have certain goals. So it's a mix of like your biology, your choices, but what are you actually striving towards? And I, I love, I just, it's, it's really amazing. So thank you for all of that. Um, one thing I want, I'm shifting gears a little bit, you know, one of the things that so many of our levels members are motivated by in terms of improving metabolic health and sort of the doorway that leads them to the metabolic health world is concern about healthy aging and specifically about the brain and Alzheimer's dementia. We're having so many simultaneous brain health epidemics rising right now across neurodegenerative disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, and mental health disorders that all seem to be you know, going up at the same time, which of course, if you look at the newspaper, it's like, huh, why is this happening? It's so strange. It's like, you know, and obviously <laughs> we, we are focused on the metabolic sort of trunk of that tree that has unfortunately not made it to the mainstream yet. But I'd love for you to talk specifically about the ketogenic diet as a tool for brain disorders of all kinds, you know, kind of just generally like what, wh how can he ketones help the brain? Um, and how are these conditions related? And what is, is there data that's suggesting that like this can be a tool to help with prevent or reverse some of these issues in across that sort of brain spectrum? So very broad question, but I'd love for you to speak to it because I know you've produced so much amazing content and even publications on this. Yeah. You know, um, again, my, my tapestry was to offer peak brain performance for patients. Right. And when I wasn't really using the metabolic um, I mean, I could tell them they needed better sleep and I knew that was really important. And I knew that being overweight was a predictor of their brain aging too fast, uh, that their A1C, the higher it got, the more likely they were to have a brain disorder. But I didn't put this in the, as the baseline for how all of my brain patients, well, if you want, if you have a brain, you should have it first, have ketones in, in circulation if you're trying to age it without those dementia risks. And it doesn't mean zero, but it means the best way we know to control that is that even in people with mild cognitive impairment, which uh, you remember that, uh, that 25 point, or no, 30 point uh, uh, test where you have the patient draw a clock and you ask them all these questions and then you say, okay, if you've got a 25 or above, you're, gonna, you're going to have uh, normal. But if you get 25 or below, uh, we start to call it mild cognitive impairment. And as soon as it's even a few more points under that, we call it dementia. Um, well, when they studied people looking at, well, they're aging, but they are right on the edge of that mild cognitive impairment. And they added uh, medium chain triglycerides. Now, they did this knowing that there are two specific chains of fat, one that's eight carbons long and one that's 10 carbons long. So uh, 
you know, medium chain triglyceride C8 and medium chain triglyceride C10, and those readily cross the blood brain barrier and become fuel options for your brain cells, for the astrocytes and the oligodendrites. Uh, these, these metabolism uh, fuel sources were, uh, are not limited uh, in many ways like the glucose is. Ketones are also able to cross that blood brain barrier without, um, without limitations or with different limitations than what a glucose molecule would have. So the people in this study were, they were glucose dependent uh, and they had, they were pretty naive to um, the medium chain triglyceride oils. Uh, and they started these mild cognitive impairment patients on, uh, I think it was like 30 and then 45 grams, which is a lot, of oil a day that was these that were these specific chains that they knew would cross the blood brain barrier. Well, they had to get past the third day without so much diarrhea that they gave up. So there was a big fallout right when you start eating a bunch of fat and your body's not ready for it. But for the people who made it, uh, their mild cognitive impairment was statistically back up to a normal rate uh, within one week of doing that. Meaning what they, uh, what they postulate and what I am a believer of is that as you, as you age a brain in a fuel uh, uh, chemistry of glucose fuel all the time, uh, it becomes resistant. That's what insulin resistance, it doesn't use that glucose as, uh, as it should. It doesn't get into the cell as it's supposed to. And so the cell is starving. It can't get the fuel it's supposed to. But it would use a fuel like ketones or a fat uh, if it could get access to it. And so when you flooded the system with it and it crossed that blood-brain barrier, there, there, first of all, there's scans on spec scans. Uh, what was dormant, what was not functioning is back to functioning. And that correlated with their testing that they went from this mild cognitive impairment, which I don't want that ever because it's the next step is dementia. Uh, that mild cognitive impairment went back up to normal functioning within a week, within a week. I don't have a med that works that fast. And so to me, that was the, I mean, not only is that, um, you know, people, the next question or next, what most physicians would be asking is, is it safe? Is it safe to do this? I'm like, let's go to the kids whose brains were riddled with seizures. Uh, so, so much that they put them in the hospital and says, you failed Depakote, you failed lithium, we're going to have your whole family admitted to the hospital, and you're going to be known as the ketone kids, that you had to be on a ketogenic diet. And they were really compliant because in a state of ketosis, the, this section of kids stopped having seizures. And as soon as that chemistry shift changes, and I'd like to say it in a different way, as soon as the fuel that was the anti-inflammatory, that was the readily available, was missing in their brain, they seized. And yeah, if you've ever seen one of these EEGs, they have like hundreds of seizures a day. Like, how are you counting all that? I mean, that's, there's so many seizures in a day that one seizure destroys a bunch of brain cells. How do you recover from a hundred of them in a day for two years? Okay, so these kids have just rotten luck that their brains were that destroyed. And then they get on the ketogenic diet and they stop having seizures. And of course, they're not perfect at first, but they get to the point where, dang straight, I did not go off this diet because I have a seizure. I pee my pants in front of my friends and life is not good for another two weeks because I post-concussive. Okay, so now they age. And when I wrote my book in 2015, there had been a couple of autopsies put into the literature of the brains of the people at autopsy that were the ketosis kids. They had gotten into their 90s, 80s or 90s, whatever it was, and, and died and they were in this study, the kind of study that I like, which is not run by a drug company and it's not funded by this person and it's not corrupted by that person. The guy dies and we look at an autopsy and the people who start the study, well, they're dead because it's uh, a life, you know, they started it when they were in their 60s and then they pass it along and now these people are dying and we get to look at their autopsy. And, I am reading this report and saying, well, I have brain envy and I don't have brain envy very often. Like what, why, look at that. There, there is no neurofibril tangles. They, they do not have the divots and missing fat components that nicely insulated neurons are everywhere. And this isn't like a, you know, a 30 year old, it's a 90 year old. 
uh, and it's in that story, you can you can hopefully read between the lines that what was happening through the years of a constant state of ketosis is, well, these kids really did well. Uh, there were other uh, side benefits found in the next several autopsies, but uh, when it pertains to brain health, um, the safety data, you have to look no further than putting these kids on it, and they were there for a lifetime. And we have autopsies at the end of their life saying, pristine, beautiful brains. And that, um, you know, and there's, you know, many more of them that have added to the file since 2015. Uh, as you look at that um, understanding, though, when patients come to me and they have autism or they have depression or they have bipolar or they have, you know, you know, wet brain, now dry brain because they're just sober, but they have really had a hit to their brain from uh, substance misuse and, um, you know, other forms of mental health issues that turn into a rotten looking brain. And they say, well, what would you do? And, and the answer is... I would do what I am doing, which is fueling my brain with ketones every day in a way that I usually can deliver with a diet. Sometimes I will supplement if I'm being human uh, and you know I've not eaten as well as I should. But the reason I do it is because, well, I love what it does to my brain and I have some of the most incredible experiences with patients that I mean, the, let's take the article that um, I shared with you and you um, have that Chris uh, Palmer, a psychiatrist from Harvard, uh, he and I had been on stage a few times. And oh, it, it, again, it was one of those places where I was so comforted by somebody else saying what I was doing. And I was like, I am not going to be first again. Somebody else say it out loud first. And when he did, I was like, and then if you've ever been to one of these conferences, the people come around, swarm around me and they swarm around him. So we get these like two minute blurbs and then a year later, we're on stage. And then we got a two-minute blurb. And uh, finally, I cornered him and said, I just want to tell you about this case. Um, so I am a big proponent of support groups. Um, this comes from the data uh, in my private clinic where uh, I took care of lots of brain people, but some of the most difficult um, stories and the saddest funerals were the brains that didn't make it out of substance abuse. And from mothers to grandmothers to teachers that just couldn't kick the habit, uh, it became this place where I, anything I could do to do better, that was the pain of those funerals still haunts me. Could I have done better? Could we have done something different? And um, so I have my own electronic medical record and I'm very data driven. And so I go back to see who are the people that made it five years sober? And what, what medication was I using? Did I give them a Vivitrol shot for six months or did I do it for 18 months? Was it that they, you know, was it this antidepressant? Was it that, you know, was it uh, TMS before uh, the six month or was it after? I was looking for something like was going to cut down the line and I found it. Like, oh my gosh, look at the outlier. Look at that every single one of the people in the five-year mark of sober, they did. And the answer was not me. It was they attended the support group. They looked in the eyes of other people and said, yeah, I screwed it up. Uh, here's how I got back on the wagon. Uh, here's what they, they were in relation. They were triggering mirror neurons, which are the cells in our brains that copy behavior. And when you grow up in a environment where you don't see a behavior, and now you're being asked as an adult to use it, the only option, the only way that brain can learn it is to watch it in another person before they can activate it in themselves. And that's, you know, the group was the number one separator. I mean, it was, a, it was not even close. It makes it look embarrassing that they even came to me. They should have just gone to group because that was the defining. Like, if you want to learn a new behavior, you have got to be in relationship with other people who are working on it too. And you got to show up with a little grace for yourself and know that the grace for others and yourself are always the same. So if you're being nice to them uh, and you're not being nice to yourself, you're lying to one of you. That joy of improvement and sharing 
out trumped everything we were doing. And so when I look at um, the support group, I, um, I host a support group. And you can say it's selfish because how do you get a support group of keto people? Uh, but it also came out of a little bit of desperation when I was living in South Dakota. I had a, a, a wonderful Brazilian woman who was a little bit crazy one day and wanted me, wanted to become my patient. And this was at the time where I could not take on one more patient. My staff would kill me. We were so far behind. I needed a helper and like anybody ever needed a helper. And it was just in a season where that wasn't in the budget. And how do I keep going? And she wanted to see me for a keto diet, ketogenic diet. And I'm like, you don't need to see me for a ketogenic diet. Just read the book. And she goes, you need to teach a class. And I'll be your first student. And there was something about that where if you've ever had these moments in life where you know you should say no, but there is just something where the God takes over and makes you say yes. And I, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll lead a support group for keto. And by golly, well, that's where David showed up. David actually never saw me as a patient. He was only a, a, um, a person who came to the support group. And uh, so I, I start this support group when I moved to Tampa and this lady drives two and a half hours to come to the support group uh, that starts at eight o'clock on a Tuesday morning at the bowling alley across the parking lot from here. And she is just so thankful that um, the, um, that, the uh, that she can come and ask questions. And she's got this daughter who's a Downs, has Down syndrome and her daughter has been, has lost over a hundred pounds at this point on a low carb diet. But, well, if you've ever taken care of Down syndrome, they have, it's like their brain ages metabolically at like three times the rate the rest of us do. And especially it, most of my Down patients have had an obsession of some sort. I remember the first one uh, was they were obsessed with eating carrots. And the mother's like, no, no, no. So she said, why do you think my son is orange? And her son is like a 35-year-old Down syndrome patient uh, or patient with Down syndrome. And I, I'm like, I don't know why your son is orange. Come back next week. I got to look it up. I have no idea. I mean, I'm like a, a month into practice. And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And I call her and say, does he eat carrots? And she goes, oh, yeah. If I don't lock the front door, I'll I've found him down the street at the grocery store eating the carrots out of the, out of the grocery store. And I tell the story because it's this obsession. It's like an addiction where they have to eat it. They have to eat it. And once they get in the cycle, they're going to – it's the, like you got to lock the fridge. So fast forward, the, her daughter has Down syndrome. and. Um, and has deteriorated significantly. She has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She was, I think, 42 years old at the time. And uh, a few years prior, when the diagnosis was on the edge of, and you know, going from mild cognitive impairment to dementia, now it is absolutely Alzheimer's. You can't reverse this. She's gonna die with this. Um, she was full-time care, had gone from living in the house, doing the family chores, being a functional part of the church and, and the home life of the family to now really ornery, um, just the mood shift that comes with Alzheimer's. And um, it's a really sad story. And the, the caregiver exhaustion was everywhere. So mom had resources built around and had gone on the ketogenic diet, lost about 80 pounds herself and needed to lose probably another, I don't know if it was 30 or 40 pounds, but she comes to the support group for that. And she does what I tell her and she loses the weight. And within a couple of weeks, she goes, do you think my daughter could do this? And I said, she tells me the story. And I said, if she does it, you have got to check her fingers. You have got to check her numbers and keep track of things. Well, she is nothing if not methodical and did that. And within six weeks, this woman who had already lost 100 pounds on low carb. So that means there weren't ketones around. Um, I mean, maybe sporadically, but nothing like what we were measuring. I need you to measure her ketones every day. I need you to measure her glucose every morning. This is not a negotiation. You have to do this if I'm going to help you with this. And six weeks of persistent and documented ketosis. And she goes back into her doctor to be tested for like 
some level of something, and she was back to testing at her baseline. Uh, she was off of the antidepressants. She was off of the memory uh, medications at six weeks uh, because her continence came back. Her ability to interact with people came back. Uh, I mean, it's like she re she reversed age and was back to her baseline Down syndrome. And then her mom says, but it's even better. My daughter has never used a three-syllable word. It's not in her brain to do that. And I asked her the other day, do you, uh, do you get it? Do you get it? And she replied, I understand. And the mother wept. She goes, her brain has never worked this well. And so I told Chris this story and uh, Chris Palmer, the psychiatrist, and he's like, you have to write that up. I'm like, I get, I need that like I need a hole in the head. That's a nightmare of a job. I'm not doing that. And he goes, yes, you are. I'll do it with you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm a sucker. <laughs> so he helped me just get connected. And there were a couple people in the uh, editing process that were really nice to me saying, you can't do that in a paper. You got to use this. You got to do that. I'm like, well, I don't know. So anyway, we got this published and it really did turn out well. It, it forced me to read through her file and confirm all of the things that were, that were happening before I ever met her. And, and then uh, uh, I got a Christmas card from her this past year. And mom still comes to group probably once a month. So I get updates on her, but uh, the, the patient wrote me this letter. And uh, it's, you know, it's probably a third grade writing, but she wasn't even able to do that for years. Not only has she continued to stay on the, the, the better side of a brain function, but her cognition has continued to improve. But it is based on a mother who loves her daughter and makes sure she's in ketosis. I mean, they check their numbers together every morning. And mom says, you don't know what it's like to have your, your daughter disappear into this body and out come this, you know, the monstrous version of her that's got emotions and it's got dysfunction and it's got anger and she doesn't, and no one can praise and love like a mother, but I'm struggling and she's back and she's better than ever. So I'm in ketosis for life. It's, a, it's such a heartwarming story that I, if there was ever a brain story that needs to win, uh, like the, the most shared brain story, that should be it. I have shivers. I just, that was, that is so, so, so beautiful. Um, mm. <laughs> It's it's incredible because you will talk to, I think, a lot of doctors who will go their entire career without ever having an experience like that or a story like that, like a true, true reversal. I mean, most of us, I think the best we can hope for is management of a current level of health. And even that is sometimes wishful thinking or a slower progression of decline. You know, that's, that's sort of like that's sort of like winning in the medical system as, or I feel like how we're trained. And so this is incredible. Um, and I'm imagining you see this type of thing all the time. Yeah. I mean, that's an extreme case of somebody who said, uh, you're on my no list. You have Alzheimer's. We can't reverse that. Yeah. And then it's in a down, a down patient, patient with Down syndrome. And I wonder if you could speak to kind of in, we, we, we sort of covered, that's a beautiful example of the neurodegenerative um, sort of part of the spectrum. What have you seen in terms of more the mental health focus? So depression, anxiety, maybe bipolar, things like that. Um, and then also the neurodevelopmental. I, I um, saw one of your videos on ADHD, and I think it'd be really interesting to hear about maybe both in relation to children and adults, um, if, if you've had just just any thoughts on sort of like dietary interventions as first line foundational treatment for mental health and neurodevelopmental. Um, you know, I think for a lot of people, this might be the first time they'd ever even thought about that or heard of that. So what, what kind of results have you seen? What, what's the science say? Yeah, I think, um, as, as a practicing clinician, um, you, you love it when you can find a study that comes and supports what you're doing. Uh, but many times in my 20 plus years of seeing patients, there's something happening in front of you that you're trying to recognize and then replicate. And um, 
I mean, I've been screening for depression from the first day I left the track of becoming an ICU doctor and said, I'm going to be home for my kids. And that means my, my husband likes to say, you went from being one of the highest reimbursed physicians to the lowest, and we still have the same medical school bills. <laughs> I said, yes, but our kids won't be in rehab as much. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Uh, but the, the, the beauty is that primary care outpatient had so much depression when I got there. Like, oh my word, look at all this stuff. I mean, it really, I, I remember thinking at about six weeks, like, I would do just about anything for an intubated patient and because they couldn't complain about their mental health. Like, what the heck? I'm an internist. Why am I doing this? And what I realized is I cannot improve their, their health if their brain is doing this. And I was in a leadership course at the time where it, it was really empowering us to take control of the things that are the most irritating to us. And it was like somebody gave me permission to help them. I'm like, oh, well, let's do this. Let's formulate that. <laughs> so every patient got a PHQ-9 from that point on. And I think it was like 350 of them before I got one that wasn't severely or moderately depressed. This is just standard primary care practice, just like all comers. And it's getting worse, right? I mean, these depression rates in teens are just going up astronomically. Like, okay, so you're seeing like fairly universal depressive symptoms. Right. And so then you start throwing Prozac, Paxil, Zola, Selexa, Cymbalta, blah, 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 all these meds. And you say, okay, you're not going to feel a dang thing for at least 10 days. And then you're going to come back to see me in a month and we might be able to see a separation. But everybody else says it's six weeks before we can see anything. And you're just going to trust me that I know what, that this is going to help you. And of course, the only way you know it's helping you is that the PHQ-9 got better. And that means they didn't have anorgasmia or whatever else was affecting their body and brain. And then comes the ketogenic diet where I, I would have girlfriends. Okay, so my practice is in South Dakota was closed. I cannot take on another patient. My staff will go, it, it will revolt if I take on one more person. Um, and my girlfriends would come to me saying, um, would you just write me an antidepressant? And I said, I'll do it, but you should really just pee ketones for th three weeks and watch what happens. So this is where the, the story started for me personally, where I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm seeing something in front of me. And again, this is 2015. I can't quite make sense of this. I can't find any good literature of anybody else. I hadn't met Chris Palmer yet. <laughs> and the um, what would happen is I'm like, I know it sucks. Just give up the damn carbs, 20 total or less. Take these ketone strips, pee on them. I'll send the script in, but just don't pick it up for 10 days watch what happens. And they did not pick it up. They're like, I can't believe how much better I am. I'm like, yeah, it was such a remarkable difference. And again, I'm saying here, write this script. I'll see you at Christmas uh, because it's going to take a while and you're going to have side effects. We're going to change the dose and we're going to change the diet and you're going to have a fight with your husband and think it's the pill's fault. And No, uh, this you're just wasting time. Trust me, pee ketones for, for two weeks and watch what happens. And uh, so, so that was my first, like, okay, I, I need to make a rule that I'm not going to keep writing this unless you are really continuing to, A, come to support group, and I know you're there because I'm there, uh, and B, continue to get back to a ketogenic state as, as frequently as you can. And, um, you know, that's where exogenous ketones were a place that if they got out of funk, take some until you can get the rules, can you even find that rhythm of life again? And we've all been in and out of rhythm that it really is, once you get into this habit of really, this is how I play it, I can keep it. But when you fall out, you're kind of like, oh, okay. But I need ketones in order to get your brain working right. So trust me on this, don't, don't get away from that. We can chemically induce your ketones, much like I'm gonna chemically induce a reuptake inhibition with Prozac. Uh, trust me on this, this is better. And so that was step one. Um, then, the, then the ADHD literature, like as adults are profoundly on uh, stimulants, I will not write for them unless they are in a state of ketosis. Like you find another doctor to play this game because I'm not your girl. I will not write for a stimulant unless you're in a constant state of ketosis, that your brain is 
you, you are not helping yourself with taking that long term unless you're in a state of persistent ketosis and I need evidence. I'm not saying, yeah, I peak ketones. Look at last week. No, I need a continuous glucose monitor. I need you all following things. I need you reporting in on your Keto Mojo app that I can see you've got ketones in circulation. And really, um, the number of prescriptions I needed to write became very unlikely. I also am the mother of teenage boys. Uh, now, the, the youngest is 17, but I have 17, 20, and 22. And so in this last season of watching them and their friends age through that you know rapid brain development, and especially boy brains doing the most um, maturity from 16 through 25, uh, I mean, it's been a profound gift for my kids that uh, our family became a very ketogenic family when my mother was uh, faced with a life or death. Mom, you're going to be in ketosis or you're going to die. Um, and that story is what Any Way You Can is about. It's about 70% story, 30% science, which is usually just enough for people to stay focused all the way to the end. Uh, and so my kids by accident have um, had their deepest brain development in a time where Were they always in ketosis? No, but they are not metabolically ill. They are metabolically strong and healthy. And, um, and I feel it's a gift that I would have never done had I just kept seeing patients the way I was and doing what I was doing. Instead, I lost a bet to my husband, taught people about a ketogenic diet, have lived one for myself. And um, I was the mom who would go in and show, here's what your brain looks like when you drink alcohol and you're a teenage boy. And this is what it is four days later. And now look at my Alzheimer's patient. You are worse than my Alzheimer's patient when it comes to drinking alcohol during such rapid brain development. And then I'll show them pictures of, and here's what happens when you smoke marijuana. Here's what happens at day two. Here's what day four. And then when you quit, 40 days later, here's still what's happening. 80 days later, here's still what you did. It is a fat, soluble molecule that goes into the brain and it stays in the fat cells of your brain for 90 days, period. Yeah. So I was that mom, right? And showing brain scans and doing all these uh, educations for my kids because if their friends heard it, uh, then they heard it. But what was more powerful was um, that how many of my, how many of my kids' uh, friends were suffering? And my kids would recognize, boy, mom, it's just they all they eat is carbs, and then their energy goes way up, and then it goes way down, and they're calling it ADHD, but it's to they they have sugar in their pocket so that every two hours they can eat. And of course, we've seen this as clinicians that you're like, God, you eat all the time. What the heck? You got to stop. Um, I mean, you get up in the middle of the night to eat. What do you think is there's a problem here? And so I was very attracted to, um, I think it was um, a psychiatrist, last name is Eads, but I'm forgetting her first name. And she's uh, connected to Chris Palmer somehow, but maybe it was just about we met on stage at the same time, but her rule as a psychiatrist is, I will not write a stimulant for a child unless you have put them on a low carb, um, whether or not she called it keto, I can't remember, but it was get the processed foods out, get the sugar out. When that mood is going up and down and up and down, what you're really doing is you are stimulating that mitochondria to burn out a bunch of fuel and then it crashes. And your ketones are not, oh, not in, you're, they're not, flex, you don't have a flexible metabolism. You go to zero and they starve and they get crabby and irritable. And that looks just like a non-focused, irritable attention deficit. And so then it's much easier to label, give it a pill, stimulate the crap out of it, and not fix the problem, but have a prescription that must be the answer. And so personally, I, I can't believe how many of the antidepressants I've stopped. And I'm, I think the drug companies are, uh, you know, I, I know them. They are wonderful people. I get that they have a job to do, but I think it is a, a tragedy that it is not better educated that your brain prefers ketones. And when you fuel it like that, it works like a superpower. We are the most advanced brain on earth. And when you fuel it correctly, it is quickly recovered. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's devastating the brain stuff because it's like, like you just said, it's like, we've been gifted with this miraculous, you know, mind and brain and 
all it wants is just fuel. So it can create magic for us every day for this beautiful life that we have. Like it's just ready. It knows how to create magic. And then we put it in the standard American diet and we sleep deprive it and we do all this stuff. And this beautiful machine creates, you know, what can be such a painful, devastating life experience of, you know, loss for me, you know, actually when I was in my surgical residency and was almost certainly metabolically dysfunctional and, you know, just a mess. And my, 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 I, what I, what I described to my parents, I was like, it felt like I was thinking in color and now I'm thinking in black and white and I didn't have creativity and my mood was very just flat. And it's like, you know, it was an under fueled brain. It just was. And then once, you know, got out of that and the, the fuel was better and I was putting better, it comes back, you know? And so it's just, yeah, it it's just devastating, and it, there are it's and this this moral hazard with the health with the pharmaceutical industry. Like, and I'm I'm with you. I know a lot of really wonderful people in that industry. It's not that the people are bad; it's that the incentives are bad because these are publicly tra- traded companies that are designed to grow. And the only way you grow companies that are making medications for chronic disease is by you know there needs to be chronic disease. And so it's just it's so interesting, and um, that's why honestly think about things like media, YouTube, podcasts, like other ways to get this information out. It's so important. And it's not surprising that there's a lot of your videos that have millions of views because, you know, people are looking, are hungry, but it's not, it's not coming through the mainstream. So I just so commend you. Um, and, uh, I think maybe just to wrap us up here, I, we have so many, so the core sort of demographic of levels members is actually women ages like 35 to 55 which is kind of people think that's surprising because they're like, oh, I thought it was like young biohacker men maybe. And it's actually, it's a, our, our primary, you know, people who are interested in the company is that age group. And so a lot of mothers, um, and I'm, and I think a big question that people have, I'm sure it comes up with you a lot in your practices. How the heck do I get my kid to eat anyway, other than the standard American diet? How do we create a culture in the family where people are into this? Like, how do with kids going off to preschool and they're serving graham crackers and fig newtons and juice, which is to me just astonishing that that's legal. But, um, what, like, what would you say to a family who's listening to this and, and thinking I could never get my kid to eat this way. I could get, never get my family to eat this way. Like what is step one, two, and three for, for thinking through that, that, that element of behavior change in a family? Right. Well, so as one strong woman talking to another strong woman, I would tell the women out there to remember that you're the matriarch, that across the globe, the matriarch's rule in a family is to run the food and will be the personality of the family. There is a role for patriarch and they are a different role. But I think especially as women, uh, and women that have done some pretty brave things. You know, I, I left the family farm. I was not going to do that. I became a doctor. And I thought strong women were the ones who, I don't know, boss people around. <laughs> uh, and it turns out I shouldn't be doing that at home uh, or I'm not going to have a marriage for very long. But I do have absolute um, authority over the food and the uh, personality of our family. And when you study families, that is, that is a role that um, it's not woke. It, it is truly a traditional model of what happens inside a family unit. And I would encourage women to embrace that, that mm, I have a prayer that I say that I am an 80-year-old woman who does CrossFit so I can play with grandkids, and I'm still married to the same man. And I'm hard to live with, so that prayer is definitely going to take God to do this but that I also honor what my role is for this family to be the best health it can be, not because I'm a doctor, but because I own the matriarchal roles in a family, which means you buy the groceries, you choose the foods. The options in front of your kid don't involve cereal because you don't buy that. That you are the mother. The reason you care about this more than them is because you're the matriarch. It's designed in you to be passionate about this. And it is your role to lead the family in a way that you need to be empowered by. And yes, it will be a fight. It's what happens when you withdraw from sugar. They're going to be crabby. But 
my son is a, a, a perfect example that he's the youngest and he's a wrestler. The other two are not wrestlers. They followed their mother's rules and did debate, no head injuries. Uh, but this wrestler now needs to make weight and he doesn't like sardines any more than the next guy. But I would, I would challenge you to call him and say, what's in your backpack today? Not because he likes sardines, but because that mother was around saying what was true. Look, the carbs are going to slow down your brain. The carbs are going to put you to sleep in, this, in the period right after lunch. And yes, you can't always control what's going on in a preschool right now, but you control what happens in your home. And then as those kids age, and you think it's teenage years and they're not listening to you, they're listening and they're following you. And when they have a mother who pays attention to the label and the processed part of foods and doesn't buy the crap that she doesn't want them to eat and takes on the fight, takes on the role to say, you wanna know what a strong woman is? She stands bravely and says, this is my role in the family and I'm gonna do a good job of it. That's what I tell women. Whew. Wow, that's, that's, I mean, I feel like in this day and age, for better, more, no, oddly, that's like a, that's like a very, um, bold statement to make, you know, and I, but I, I think there's so much importance to it. And I just speaking personally, like I don't have children yet, but I, I dream of that, you know, I, I mean, obviously my life is metabolic health, you know, but like, uh, uh, it, it excites me in a way to think about being in that role of this protector of the nutrition of the, you know, of these bodies that you've created in your body. And like, I think a lot about, you know, not to get too off track here, but just like just this privilege and honor I have to, to, to grow these bodies, you know, in my, and, and what environment is that going to be? And how do I at 35 prepare for that now, you know, and like create the best conditions that chemistry set for both that, that growth. And then when they're out, you know, to continue that through strong, what I would say, like moral leadership with around food, like in a family. And it's just, um, like there's a lot of industries and a lot of people and, uh, I would be industries. I would say that really want us to question that, you know, like, and to, to feel like it's actually wrong to have strong feelings around food, that that's going to harm your kid in some way, like, you know, like create, disordered eating or this and that. And I think it's just, you know, I think that the way you position it of like, there kind of needs, and Kelly Levesque, one of our advisors says as well, like there needs to be an adult in the room when it comes to food. Cause otherwise every other force is going to basically try and use your child as a profit center. Like how much processed food can we put in this? How many medications can we put in this unit, this person? And it's like, I think when you understand those incentives of what is actually, what are the forces that want your child to be sick, dependent, and addicted? And then as a, as your role as a parent, like how can you be that, that protector in a way? And so it's complex, but, um, it's just beautiful how you laid it out and, um, honestly very motivating. So, um, it sounds like you mixed, you know, uh, some philosophy, some really strength of will, some, a lot of education with your kids is what I'm hearing. And then of course, keeping the house environment as clean as possible in terms of food. Like, are those some of the elements that you sort of think about, or is, is there anything else like in terms of practical strategies for, you know, what you do when the kids like are going to school or birthday party, like any other pearls that you might recommend to, to parents, like, if they've kind of got those bases covered, they're not buying the food, they're serving healthy meals, they're educating their kids and they have strong, you know, sort of sense of will and leadership around this, like any other tips that you've, that have worked well with parents to kind of make a transition to a healthier environment for the family? My favorite advice as a mom is I, well, I was the sergeant, I raised boys. <laughs> so uh, as you look at, I mean, boys and girls are different, uh, but at the beginning it was very uh, firm boundaries on what your job was. And uh, I remember one of my best friends had kids at the same time as me and she had girls, a boy in the middle, but three kids. And uh, I had three boys and we meet each other about 10 years into you know reproduction and uh, her three kids are sitting lovely. And my uh, boys walk in the room and I'm like, sit, stay, no, don't touch that. And she goes to her husband, 
I think she thinks they're dogs. <laughs> and I'm like, you have no idea how hard it is. They're whirlwinds of energy. And if you let up for a second, your house will be destroyed. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think everybody's personality comes into motherhood and mine was being very authoritative at the beginning. Uh, but then I really, uh, you know, the acts of service that you do in your community, your children will copy. So I became that mom and just said, you know, what do teenagers listen to? They, they need humor and they need peer, their peers, the, you know, humor and, and playfulness and peers are the ways that you make a difference in teen years. And, um, so I was, I tried to find ways into that, uh, part of, I can't be the humor. I can't, I can be, uh, you know, influence their peers by doing some of the things I volunteer to do in my community. And I, I'll just tell you the, that they're listening. They are listening. Um, the seasons of life of raising kids is something I, well, boy, I, I, you know, for the women who out there who want motherhood or, uh, in, in any way they get it, whether it's adopting the neighbor's kid because she, she's just overwhelmed uh, in, a, in a time where they just need a helper, or if it's your own children, that it, there's nothing in my life that's been more rewarding, but also uh, a, a time of truly looking at who am I as a, as a woman and as a person. And um, I, I mean, it's fun. I, I see um, my behavior flaws in all of them now, uh, but also that they they did adopt. I mean, especially as they left the home and uh, the, they are they don't they won't tell me they're low carb, but they intermittent fast and they do the they don't talk to me about it. They talk to their dad, so I know they're very mindful. They know what the rules are and. Uh, I think it's just that constant, you know, how do kids learn? They watch their parents. So give them a good example and then ha have the boundaries that are necessary when it comes to nutrition. You buy the food, dude. Uh, keep the options at home clean. You can't control the world, but this little micro universe called your home, you can. And it makes all the difference. Beautiful. Oh my gosh. Dr. Boz, I could talk to you all day. As you know, we had a list of questions we had for, you know, prepared. I feel like we got through just a couple of them, but it was like 10 times even richer than I could have imagined. And so maybe we'll, maybe if there's ever opportunity to do, do another one, this is amazing, but I'm so grateful to you for the work you've done, the spirit that you bring to this, just the, the deep, um, you know, integrity that you bring to this, it comes through so much. And I'm just, uh, I'm so grateful that you are also a storyteller. You bring a lot of this alive in a way that I think, you know, but we're not trained to be storytellers as doctors, but that really helps people feel it so differently. So I just really, um, admire you and I'm so grateful for this conversation. Um, thank you so, so much. And if you would like to share with people, how they can, um, find you and get in touch with you. We'll make sure to put it all in the show notes, but um, what are the best places for people to continue to learn from you? Right. Best thing that I have put my energy into the most has been YouTube. So find me on YouTube. Uh, that is, there are other platforms I'm on and you're, you'll find your way there eventually, but start with YouTube and um, I, find me every Tuesday night live is when I give a live uh, presentation. And um, if you're ever in Tampa, there's a free support group at the bowling alley across the parking lot. <laughs> 